Hi everyone. Um, I hope you guys are good. Uh, we are going to be starting another paper. You have to give me a few minutes and then we're going to begin. Hi everyone. Uh, so let's start. Uh, we are doing today, June 2021. Variant is uh, two, question number one. Uh, so let's start with the data response. Um, and uh, then um, we will begin with our essay questions. So this one is June 2021, variant two. It says uh, competition in passenger aircraft uh, manufacturing, two companies. Um, could use all of the world's passenger aircraft with a seating capacity of over 150 passengers. The supply of these is about 1,600 aircraft a year and is divided almost equally between the two competing companies who both benefit from extremely strong brand identity and customer loyalty. The aircraft are made in two versions, one um, single aisle aircraft that carry 200 passengers and double aisle aircrafts that carry 300 and 500, uh, 350 passengers. In 2018, both companies uh, took over other firms which produce a range of aircraft seating between 40 and 150. The owner of the other firms had difficulties in financing and developing their new aircraft. So clearly this is an oligopoly where the firms are taking over and becoming two major players in the market. Recent competition in the aircraft manufacturing industry has aimed at improving fuel efficiency developing longer non-stop flying ranges and developing very large aircraft with a capacity of 500 passengers. The companies have been successful in achieving the first two aims. The third aim of developing very large aircraft was uh, intended to move larger number of passengers between hub airports where they would transfer to smaller aircraft for onward transport to regional airports. Um, while it has achieved increasing uh, passenger capacity. This development has not been a success for the airlines that 
bought these very large aircrafts. The need of uh, for these uh, was undermined by the success of the first two competitive developments. So, guys, the third aim was developing very large aircrafts, and um, uh, this was basically an idea where you could create hub um, for onward transport. Um, you know, like how Qatar is kind of like a hub, or for example, Dubai is kind of like a hub. So something like that. The nature, um, the nature of the aircraft manufacturing industry is that it involves significant fixed costs. So this is kind of like an oligopoly structure. The research and development is also large, almost twenty-six billion dollars. Currently, two companies are concerned uh, that China, in its drive to increase the value of its exports, will enter the aircraft. Um, manufacturing industry in the next 10 to 15 years and add a new level of competition. So China is a looming sort of uh, threat. Using the information, explain the market structure. So clearly the market structure with the market size, you can see the market structure is very much like uh, an oligopoly. Why? Because there are two firms two firms with significant market share. Make sense, guys? Uh, if you look at the um, information given, they said two companies produce all of world's uh, uh, passenger aircraft with a seating capacity. So this clearly means two firms are dominating the market which means that we're looking at a situation where you are having um, an um, oligopoly situation. Guys, does that make sense? Any question? Anyone, any questions before we move on? Okay, let me move on. Um, so to the next part, um, we say, uh, Explain why the two companies um, why the two companies uh, might be concerned about the potential entry of China into the aircraft. Uh, well, potential entry of China uh, basically uh, will result in you know a situation. Remember, there was a theory that we've done, which is called contestable market theory. The contestable market theory means your if your contestable if your potential competition can become actual competition so potential competition can become actual competition what then basically it will be bad for you so what you do as a result of that basically you will need to you know like make sure that you lower prices which will also mean lower profitability to make it sort of uh, unattractive for new firms to enter. And the second thing you do is also uh, conduct R&D. So you do research and development uh, to lower costs. So you make it difficult for new firms to enter. So clearly what you can see is that uh, when you're, why will you be concerned? Because if the new firm enter in the market, the demand will fall leading to lower sort of market share, right? So that's your uh, fair and therefore you may need to sort of lower prices and conduct R&D, which will cut down on your profitability because you don't want new firm to enter. So explain why the two companies might be concerned because of, you know, possible entry of New firms to enter. Now, guys, uh, a lot of you, um, you know, like one of the things that I want to say here is, is that if there are two topics that are very likely to come in your, uh, or two, I mean, macro uh, data response are one, but if there's a micro data response, very likely it comes from oligopoly. So you need to be mindful of that. Okay. Uh, so that's why oligopoly is a good topic to prepare because your questions can come from that part. Okay. The third uh, question, um, any questions before we move on to the next one? Okay, 
The nature of the ACAF manufacturing industry is that it involves significant, somebody's asking me a question, could you explain more about how they can turn their uh, into, how can, turn, I mean, so what happens on mold is, is that the entry of new firms, basically that results in uh, your um, basically uh, profit to be driven out because you will now be sharing your market with another player. And this will reduce your demand and therefore your profit. So what you do is that you try to limit competition to enter. You limit competition to enter by lowering your price so that it becomes unattractive for new firms to enter. Or it's also called sometimes limit pricing, limiting competition. Or you also sometimes do research and development and marketing, uh, which in turn results in basically sometimes Yo, you to have uh, that economies of scale or that kind of advantage which, which makes it difficult for new firms to enter. And you can, therefore, your cost is so low that new firms will find it impossible to enter. So you, you need to do these things in order for uh, China's sort of uh, potential entry to not become actual entry. Got it? Does that make sense? Okay, so uh, let me know if you have any questions because I'm gonna move on to now C parts. Using an example from the information explain the meaning of fixed costs. So fixed costs, they've given significant R&D. Fixed cost is basically the R&D. And what is fixed cost? Fixed cost is uh, the cost that, that does not vary with the level of output. So the way we define fixed cost is that it is, it is the cost that does not, doesn't, vary with the level of output. Okay, so for example, R&D here, research and development is a fixed loss, right? Uh, because it doesn't increase or doesn't vary with the level of output. Okay, does that make sense? So this is easy. B part says with the aid of a diagram, it's been the link between an increase in an AFCAP manufacturing level of output and its average fixed cost. So guys, average fixed cost is simply fixed cost over quantity, okay? As quantity goes up, average fixed cost falls. So if you look at from the perspective of, um, the diagram, if I write average fixed cost, and quantity, this is how my average fixed cost looks like. Yes, the quantity goes up. Average fixed cost falls. So average fixed cost declines. Got it? Are we good? Any questions, guys? So you need to mention that as the quantity rises, because the fixed cost is constant, average fixed cost declines over the range of output. Could it be zero at any point? No, it approaches zero, but never is never zero. Okay, it approaches zero, but it's never zero. Got it, guys. Does that make sense? Okay, let's look at the next one. Uh, Deepak, Deepak says, discuss whether economic theory can explain how two companies will compete with each other when they dominate in a market. So Two companies will compete with each other when they dominate in the market it means that we're looking at uh, the behavior of, we're looking at the behavior of oligopoly. Okay, so the behavior of oligopoly is basically uh, when you are two companies that are competing with each other when they dominate a market, uh, it's basically you could uh, do what we call, um, you know, and they think two companies compete and not collude. Uh, but the argument is that this, in, a, in an oligopoly, there is interdependence, okay? Because in this market, because you have interdependence, 
there will be a possibility of competition or collusion. And they can compete on prices or non price competition. Okay, so compete on prices or non price competition can be a possibility. So when you compete on prices, they could be, you know, like you could give examples of uh, the theories that are basically here. You can give examples of uh, the king demand curve. Okay, you can give an example of exam your game theory. Okay, or you could even talk about the non price competition, which is basically the after sale service, the marketing and advertising. Because in these markets, you will see marketing and advertising happening. You could also talk about how there is more money spent in innovation to stay as a market leader and, you know, like after sales service, etc. So, uh, discuss whether economic theory can explain how two companies will compete with each other when they dominate a market. So, when they look at dominating a market, guys, the, the King Demand Curve, which is a quick recap of King Demand Curve theory. King Demand Curve theory says, says that the firms, here, when they're competing with each other, will face this kind of a diagram. They, Elastic diagram in the upper half till let's say price P1 and the quantity is Q1. And then an inelastic demand curve beyond uh, price P1. Similarly, the MR will be elastic in the upper half and then inelastic in the lower half. And they say that if this is the average, the marginal cost, then the marginal cost may change, may go up or down. But the profit maximizing firm will make sure that the prices remain P1 and the quantity remains Q1. In other words, they will be what we call price rigidity because firms may not want to compete on prices. They may want to compete on what we call non price competition because there's a fear of lowering prices and therefore, and therefore losing business. And anytime the, the price is too high, beyond let's say this point X or below this point Y, will you see a change in prices? Otherwise, firms will more or less won't change prices. The game theory on the other hand says this, that firms, for example, in a prisoner's dilemma, if you remember prisoners, prisoners, am I missing on one prisoner's uh, dilemma, Prisoner's dilemma. Uh, but the argument basically is that when you're looking at prisoner's dilemma, the prices basically can be such that the two firms may end up competing with each other rather than polluting. And they may choose prices which are going to make them worse off than had they polluted. Had they colluded, things would have been different, but they end up sort of competing with each other. Now, guys, this is an eight mark question, which means you're spending 16 minutes uh, with each other, which uh, I mean, on, on this question. And so you have a lot to talk about in this question. So do write your proper answer. Now, I want to talk about basically discuss whether economic theory can explain how two companies you, you need to have basically um a conclusion also uh so you can talk about that in this uh market structure because of uh, interdependence there could be possibilities of both competition and collusion 
and um, if they we if we look at the behavior the behavior could not be predicted because it may depend on many factors such as you know the degree of competition such as whether they will collude or compete and therefore um, we may not be able to uh, predict from before so um, and more yes in the in the in the king demand curve theory what we say is this that the demand curve is like king and mr for the first part is like uh, a to b if if a to b is my demand curve a to x is the mr for that then since b to d is my rest of the demand curve my mr is y to mr so there is a vertical portion where the mr is not changing so marginal cost equals to mr is in, in if as as long as the marginal cost is in this zone x to y even if it goes up or down the firms will land into mc is equal to mr happening at p1 and quantity q1 so this theory says is that as long as the cost is varying between x to y the price and quantity doesn't change so there is a price rigidity that happens got it so the firms are basically least likely to change cost if it's within a particular range only if the cost goes too high like for example, if the cost goes like for example here, right? Let's call this MC3. Then you will see MC is equal to MR happening at Q2, and the price will go up. Firms do not react to small price changes because they don't don't want to uh, lose their market share to another firm. Got it? Are we good? Unmol, does that make sense? Okay, I want to move on uh, if that's a yes from everyone, because let's go and look at your um, essay questions um, and try to do them. So oligopoly is a good topic to prepare for your data response. Um, though, even though, I mean, the likelihood of uh, macro coming could be a possibility, but still you need to make sure. Do we need to know? Don't draw the chart for uh, just write a conclusion for game theory. Don't draw a chart for the game theory. Okay, no need. Okay, let's look at question number two. So I want to quickly go over this one. What is meant by efficiency uh, in relation to the uh, use of resources? We've seen this kind of question coming very often. Basically, efficiency is productive efficiency and uh, productive and allocative efficiency. So you talk about efficiency basically has, uh, when you look at from a traditional perspective, efficiency has two definitions. One is your productive efficiency. And the second one is you talk about the allocative efficiency. Okay. Please watch the video about productive plus allocative, but then you talk about also the non traditional view, which is called the dynamic efficiency, because productive and allocative is called an static efficiency, which is within one time period, and dynamic efficiency is basically uh, in multiple uh, uh, time periods, right? Allocative uh, has a condition that P must be equal to marginal cost. Productive means producing at the lowest point of the average cost for a firm. Which can only happen if MPK over price of K is equal to MPL over price of L is equal to any MP of N over price of N. Okay, please uh, go over the video that we talked about efficiency to revise this. Um, and um, dynamic efficiency, on the other hand, we know means that we are producing um, sort of doing research and development, RD, also producing. Uh, variety of products and that could be good for the consumer as well okay uh, please uh, do cover efficiency in thorough uh, manner in this question do we need to talk about perfect competition monopoly here no my friend there is no question is they're just asking us about what is what is means there is no evaluation there is no uh, sort of comparison and so on Okay, D part is where your discussion will uh, be sort of uh, uh, awesome. But market failure can always be overcome to increase economic efficiency. 
So what is market failure? We first talk about that. So please prepare this question really. Uh, I think this is an important question. So what is market failure? Uh, and within market failure, you talk about basically your, your uh, monopoly, your um, sort of uh, uh, merit and demerit goods, or externalities, public goods, information, failure, and so on. And then you talk about what are the ways that you can sort of because they say market failure can be um, all uh, can always be overcome to increase economic efficiency. So what can you do? To, to get rid of market failure. So what are the ways we can sort of solve the market failure? You talk about, we can do sort of, uh, your indirect taxes, indirect taxes. We're looking at uh, your subsidies. We talk about uh, provision of information you have direct provision of uh, goods and services, but also provision of information. Also, you're looking at uh, government to basically put laws and regulations, laws and regulations, also price controls. Right, so you can give examples of others, but then you talk about uh, reasons why this cannot happen, which is basically government failure. Sometimes government has its own kind of failures, which is basically number one is a lack of information that government has. Number two, they could be politically driven. Number three, the government uh, may not have resources or there might be an opportunity cost. And number four, you can also talk about government failure that can happen in terms of uh, the quality as the government doesn't have the right incentives sometimes. Incentives are lacking. Okay, so if I were you, I would prepare this question because I feel, could you elaborate on politically driven? Yeah, for example, let's say government wants to get reelected, they may go for popular choices and the right choices. Like a lot of people say the government needs to, you know, for example, devalue uh, sort of uh, rupee more, but the government doesn't do that because it's something which they know that it's not politically popular. Make sense? So this is a great essay question. It could be May 20 mark, what is market failure and consider how this can be overcome by the government intervention. And you could have a 20 mark question on this one as well. Okay, thank you guys. Let's move on to the next one, uh, unless you have a question. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next one then. Uh, the next one is going to talk about uh, basically Yeah, this one is about indifference curve, which is again a topic that is my uh, favorite because I, I like this topic uh, and also I feel strongly uh, uh, about it. So can you explain efficiency part, efficiency part as in we've done in the first part of efficiency. If you want to understand what efficiency, the whole discussion, you want to sort of watch the video um, because uh, explain the whole concept. Uh, this class is about what to write in exam and what not to write, how to. So please watch that video to, to get a sense of it. Okay, number one is that. Number two is basically, um, do you didn't mention any economic efficiency? I think you missed the first part. Uh, if you are the same person asking, 
the first part was about economic uh, efficiency okay um are revision notes at all academy enough for to prepare for well in all academy they have these revision notes but uh do you have my notes if you have my notes do let me know um they are on uh basically because i think um um we haven't uploaded them uh on uh, alt uh so you, you can go to econ where uh, dot uh with ali dot org and uh, you could sort of uh, um find the notes line there where which could be helpful okay does that make sense how can it help in a welcoming market failure we talked about how when you look at indirect taxes indirect taxes are put in a place uh, for a demerit goods merit goods we get subsidy when it comes to government controlling monopolies their regulations uh, also sometimes uh, price controls can be put in place and so on okay please guys you got to revise that topic it's a really important topic uh, the videos are there the content is there just go ahead and do that content um, and remember then you need to solve this kind of question i what i what i just solved is an extremely likely question to come in exam okay so uh, anyone who's um, getting for um, a good great should know efficiency really well and market failure and overcoming market failure uh, through government policies okay can you repeat which topics or do you pause for a second i'm saying the topic is market failure economic efficiency is an important topic can't go to an exam without preparing for them okay i can't see anyone who can get a good grade without knowing economic efficiency market failure and uh, uh government failure the notes have it all the videos online on the, on the all platform has it all so don't need to worry about that okay but you need to watch them to cover that content okay this question uh um, so past paper sessions are useful because they tell you what do we need to prepare for right so this is the what you need to prepare for i'm going to make a video and i'm going to show you that also with with the topics that i feel are really important uh i need a day for that to prepare but i will re, uh, sort of send it across to you guys also okay uh so use in different scope analysis to explain how an individuals demand curve for an inferior goods are, are derived so in this question guys uh the a part uh in difference curve of course is really important um, and uh, we know why because utility and difference curve is another topic it's a standalone topic which we need to know really well um given now we have two questions to choose from um one of them can be from in difference curve and another one can be from market failure so first is the definition uh, of a difference curve is a curve that shows various possible combinations of two goods a consumer uh, can consume deriving the same utility or satisfaction so when you draw a particular difference curve it gives you the same satisfaction uh, when you when you choose various combinations of two goods could be x or y so all of these combinations give consumer the same satisfaction be it uh, be it uh, sort of uh, uh any sort of uh combination a b c now the de so then we talk about because they say use a difference curve as to explain how an individual demand curve for an inferior good to be derived then we talk about inferior good an inferior good is a good where when your income go up your demand goes down but inferior good has a downward sloping demand curve it doesn't have a upper sloping demand curve is a downward sloping demand curve which means when the price goes down the quantity goes up so when you look at in difference curve analysis we need to figure out the price effect which is made up of substitution effect and income effect so substitution effect plus income effect makes up your price effect so if i draw our sort of uh, in difference curve so when the price of a good goes down right your your indifference curve is going to pivot up i'm sorry your budget line is going to pivot up right why is that so because when the price of a good goes down 
your you can your your real income uh, for one goal will go up your ability to buy will go up for one goal so first we'll draw our initial uh, sort of indifference curve i not and i forgot to make the parallel line so what we do is we make an initial indifference curve which is going to be like this let me choose another color i not where a consumer when the price goes down will buy more of the good from a to b will buy more of the good because when the price goes down the substitution effect says you buy more so we talk about the idea the substitution effect says when the price goes down the good becomes relatively cheaper and you buy more of that good because it's relatively cheaper so substitution effect always say you buy more of the good when the price goes down on the other hand somebody's asking me something we will mention about given and non-given you don't need to mention that guys don't need to mention this part only inferior Just keep it simple uh, because then you're writing about given and, and but when you look at uh, income effect guys the income effect says this when the price goes down your real income goes up and when your real income goes up income effect says that you will buy less of this good but because this is an inferior good the income effect is going to be smaller than substitution effect mainly because this good is uh, so cheap it doesn't make your income go up any significantly so you end up uh, having a very small substitution effect so your uh, your income effect so your income effect is drawn in between a and b let's say q2 this is your income effect so you are looking at the consumer to buy <coughs> less of this good now down below you will draw the diagram for this good and you'll say that as a result of this guys when you look at initially you were buying q0 then you will buy q2 which means when the price goes down your demand curve is still downward sloping because your price goes down the income effect is i wrote it wrong income effect is less than substitution effect income effect is less than substitution effect which means is it's going to be it's going to be less powerful and as a result of that substitution effect is saying buy more right income effect is saying buy less but because income effect is smaller ultimately you are buying more which means price goes down the quantity goes up for this this good and this is how you are able to derive your demand curve. the question is saying use in different curve analysis to explain how an individual consumer um, for an inferior good is derived for so how do you derive it you drive it through to this manner where you will figure out how much will he buy when the price of a good goes down first you look at substitution effect then you look at the effect and you figure that out okay uh, so here guys there is no discussion or evaluation per se i mean remember this is the old format so um we may not have that kind of uh, evaluation or discussion to happen. Had it been a new question, uh, they would have made a 20 mark and they would have asked about given or non given, or they would have said, uh, Does the demand curve um, always slope downward for um, sort of uh, different kinds of goods? So you could have sort of uh, used in difference curve analysis to talk about normal, inferior, and so on and so forth. Okay, but this one doesn't ask for that. So, yeah. Should we study economic development globalization chapter? Is it important? Well, the thing is, if you're asking, somebody's asking me about that. Uh, the thing is, it is important because um, what if you run into a situation where you have two questions for macro and you don't know the first one, at least the second one is like, Economic development and globalization is a chapter that is fairly straightforward. It doesn't have many much detail, more graphs, anything. It's just a quick read kind of a chapter. Okay. So 
I won't ignore that kind of a thing. Okay, B part says, discuss the relative importance of marginal cost and average variable cost in determining short run uh, production decisions. So guys, in the short run, when you look at a firm, a firm which is maximizing profit will maximize profit with MC is equal to MR. So firm maximizing their profit will look at MC is equal to MR. Um, can you talk about increase in price situation for all types? Did it, I would want you to watch the video, my friend, uh, or I could I could uh, look at the session. But increase in price requires. Uh, why don't you watch the video for for that? Uh, rather than this session, the session we're only focusing on past paper particular question. Okay, um, does that make sense? Because it's a long discussion. Um, it was all on fallen prices, and there was once a question which was about increase in prices, but it requires another 20 minutes, 25 minutes of her time to be dedicated for that. So we've got to be mindful of that situation as well. It is in a small discussion. Maybe I can put up a video. I'll put up a video and I'll share that. So when you look at profit maximization, the short run, a firm can make a normal profit. It can make super normal profit. Or it can make economic uh, loss. So when you make normal profit, price is greater than um, ATC. I'm sorry, price is equal to ATC. When you make super normal profit, price is less, uh, price is greater than ATC. When you make economic less loss, price is less than ATC. And so when they say relative importance of marginal cost, marginal cost is important because of profit maximization. So you talk about the principle of profit maximization, that when MC is equal to MR, you maximize profit. When MC is greater than MR, you when um, rather when MR is greater than MC, you should produce more. When MR is less than MC, you should produce less. And when MC is equal to MR, this is where you maximize profit. So the first part of this question is about profit maximization. The second part of this question is about in the short run, you can have three scenarios happening. And when you have an economic loss, this is where average variable cost will play a role because if the price is greater than or equal to average variable cost, you will produce, uh, keep on producing more or you will produce in the short run. We will continue to produce in the short run. Why? Because when the price is greater than or equal to ABC, the firm is making sure that the profit, that the price is higher. So some part of the, some, part of the fixed cost is covered, which means that this is a scenario where if you shut down, you only pay fixed cost, but because your price is greater than fixed cost, you minimize losses, minimize losses by producing where price is greater than or equal to ATC. Okay, when the price is less than ATC, but price is less than ABC also, this is where we shut down. Because then we only pay our fixed costs and discontinue production. Okay, so you talk about, because I think a uh, role of average variable cost comes into play in the economic loss situation. Talk about profit maximization principle. Here I will draw that diagram. A couple of diagrams that I will draw. One is our, you know, like MC is equal to MR concepts. So I'll take perfect competition. You can also take any other competition. Uh, this is your marginal cost. And you'll say you'll produce at the point Q star where the MC is equal to MR. So one is that diagram you will draw. Another diagram that you will draw will be of an economic loss. So you can draw a diagram where if you look at your marginal cost, 
And if you look at the average variable cost, right, the firm will produce till the point B because below that your uh, marginal cost is going to be uh, basically uh, non-existent. Okay, because this is what we call the shutdown price. So firm will produce as long as price is greater than ABC in the short run. Does that make sense, guys? Any questions? So this is straightforward. Again, this is they say discuss the relative importance of marginal cost. So when you say discuss, then this is where the uh, the the answer comes into an evaluation and conclusion. You can say that in the short run, the role of ABC becomes important only when the firm is making a loss. Otherwise, as long as price is greater than uh, or equal to ATC, the margin, uh, knowing average variable cost doesn't have much of a role to play. Okay, so that's your answer for this one. Okay, moving on to number four. Number four is a 25 mark question, which is um, basically evaluate whether the theory of wage limit can account for wage differentials between a director and a general worker in the same company and between two workers doing the same job in different companies. So when this is more of a wage differential question, but it has what we call um, wage determination as well, because when you look at uh, wage differential, let me just make all the information out there. Wage differential can happen due to due to market structure. Okay, you stop talk, talk start talking about that. And the one reason could be, you know, if this was uh, if there was perfect competition, everyone will be paid to market forces of demand supply. There will be no wage differentiation because people are identical. Only time there will be a wage sort of uh, difference, it will be because of the idea that market is probably in a short run disequilibrium. But then when you look at uh, if this perfect competition was turned into a monopsony, people will be paid less. Okay, versus if there was a trade union against a monopsony, it will all depend on bargaining power. So the first reason why people are paid differently is basically due to wage differential. Now they're saying between a director and a general worker in the same company versus between two workers doing the same job in different companies. So the idea would be that in one company versus a different company, when you're looking at a director and general within the same company, this could be more of the reasons that we'll talk about later on. But one reason why people are paid, paid, paid differently uh, could be due to market structure, but also number two, due to basic uh, human sort of differences. Like for example, in this case, we call them non-competing groups. And this is where the director and general worker will fall into place because a director, for example, will have an inelastic demand and an inelastic supply. Demand is inelastic and uh, supply is also inelastic. And as a result of that, he will have more economic rent than transfer earning and a higher wage. On the other hand, when you look at a worker, the worker will have a very elastic demand and an elastic supply. But as a result of that, his wage will be lower, like WL. And this is Q1, Q1. So this is economic rent versus transfer earning. So the idea is this, that despite these differences, the the, di the director getting more than the general worker, uh, you will see the worker to not become a director because of human differences where there's more skill, more knowledge, more intelligence, 
more education, which is causing the director to get more salary than workers. It could be uh, acquired skills like education or uh, basic natural skills, like for example, somebody might be really good. So two workers doing the same job in different companies could be in one company, there could be a market structure difference. Well, another one could have more bar bargaining power than the other. The third it could also be possibility one has a trade union stronger and another one may not have or a company. But there could be other reasons as well. It could be reasons, for example, discrimination could be one reason happening in uh, another industry. It could be also more risk taken. It could be simply uh, more education or basically work experience uh, that could be causing wage differential. So in this question, guys, you're giving all the various reasons that can happen uh, in this market structure. Does that make sense? Any questions? So the theory of wages, first you start off by talking about, you know, how are wages determined in perfect competition? You talk about MRP theory, you talk about then uh, various reasons can result in um, a market to have different different wages. Uh, like for example, due to market structures, due to demand supply elasticity, which is your basic human differences, due to education work experience, discrimination, and so on. Uh, would the bilateral graph be relevant here? Well, if you want to, um, and well, if you want to sort of discuss how monopsony, for, for example, pay less, and therefore how monopsony can be uh, sort of um, how the trade union then can ask for a higher wage. Because let's say in, in one uh, company, the trade union or workers have a higher bargaining power, then there might be a, a reason for this to happen. You know, like this discrimination could be one factor, but monopsony or trade union could be another factor. So you can draw that diagram and explain that. Remember, if this was a 20 mark question, I still have 40 minutes to talk about all of those things. So if I want to talk about monopsony, uh, I will talk about monopsony versus trade union as well to give my argument, okay? So quickly, uh, just to give you a sense, so wage differential will have due to market structures, but do start with perfect competition and then talk about various reasons why wages could be different for people within the same company or, or within different uh, companies. Okay, does that make sense? Another 20 mark, five mark question this is discuss the extent to which HDI and uh, MEW provide better measures of David standards and DNI or gross national income. So, in this question, we talk about, uh, and this is again your last chapter for macro which is talking about, uh, first of all, you need to talk about what are the various, basically, you know, uh, problems with uh, gross national income or, uh, you know, like gross national product. So we talk about gross national income basically is a, um, inc uh, is a factor which is used commonly to compare uh, income. And normally we look at real, GNI, gross national income per capita, purchasing power parity adjusted. So it's gross, uh, uh, real means it takes into account inflation and the per capita, it takes into account population and purchasing power parity adjusted will mean it takes into account the cost of living. Okay, but uh, when you look at even real GNP or GNI per capita, there are still some issues. One, GNI per capita doesn't capture all the output. So when you look at GNP per capita, it misses out on, you know, like uh, do it yourself uh, activity, the voluntary work, do it yourself activity, which includes voluntary work and domestic work by the people. Number two, it doesn't need to take into account um, the public sector sort of uh, efficiency because it looks at public sector output uh, at cost. 
Third, it also misses out on the hidden economy or the underground economy, which is huge in developing countries. Also, it doesn't capture all, all the, doesn't uh, sort of uh, capture standard of living very well. Why? Because it misses out on externalities, externalities, it misses out on uh, quality of goods. It also doesn't look into account uh, your distribution of income. And it also has a problem that it looks at production versus consumption. When you look at production, you will your standard of living may not go up because production may include C, I, G, or X minus M. Now, X goes up, it will be foreigners who will benefit because they will get our goods. I go up, it will be future benefit. But consumption is for today. If consumption goes up, that's when we say standard of living goes up. That's why we need to look at other measures. Now, HDI looks at real GNP per capita, but also HDI uh, looks at other things. It looks at education, attainment, educational attainment, other than GDP per capita. And it also looks at your health indicators through life expectancy. And as a result of that, for poor countries, it is a better measure because it looks at not only GDP per capita, but also education and life expectancy, and therefore gives a better picture than your GDP per capita. Similarly, MEW, Measurable Economic Welfare, looks at all the things that can increase welfare and add that, like for example, leisure time and all those things that decrease welfare, like for example, um, externalities and subtract that. The only downside to this one is that it is very, you know, like, uh, subjective, it's a subjective measure because you, it's hard for us to find monetary values of most of these things which MEW is trying to capture. Similarly, HDI is very popular for poor countries, how well it can be used for rich countries which don't have educational attainment other issues will be something we need to look at, okay? Guys, so this is a good question to prepare for um, our, our exams. So I do want you guys to know all the factors that make up poor versus rich country, like developing versus developed countries. Uh, need to know the problems of GDP per capita. Need to know basically all these other measures that are added in the syllabus. Okay, moving on to this one. So this one is uh, talking about explain the causes of unemployment and consider which is most likely to occur in a developing uh, country. So when you look at the causes of unemployment, uh, you can talk about causes of unemployment could be, you know, like your um, equilibrium unemployment versus disequilibrium unemployment. Equilibrium unemployment will include your um, seasonal, uh, structural, and your frictional, which is probably the bigger reason than any of the other ones. Okay, then your disequilibrium unemployment will entail basically your um, Demand deficient, which is also called cyclical, and the second one was real wage or classical. Okay, so without going into further ado in terms of like, um, you know, like what these are, because I want you guys to watch the video, please, to understand the causes of unemployment. First, you give all the causes of unemployment, and then which is most likely to occur in developing countries. Developing countries um, are basically, you can say because of information failure, the frictional and structural unemployment could be more likely to happen. 
or equilibrium unemployment is more likely to happen because of lack of uh, knowledge and skills. Okay, you can choose anyone, but I think you can talk about developing countries like Pakistan may suffer from this kind of unemployment. Now, guys, one thing which you need to do remember is this that um, sometimes there's another unemployment added to your syllabus, which was hysteresis. Hysteresis was basically the idea that uh, sometimes there could be lack of skills. Uh, I mean, long term unemployment can uh, lead to uh, uh, another sort of problem where you can, for example, um, you know, people may lose skills and therefore they could uh, run into problems. So hysteresis unemployment is basically um, when, you know, unemployment is, um, um, you know, um, long term, people may lose skills and may not be able to come back to unemployment uh, unless they are major retraining to take place. Okay, so even though the economy may recover from, um, let's say, a cyclical unemployment, people may not be able to join labor market because there's a loss of skills. That is simply what his status is. Okay. Okay, let me, let's look at B part. Uh, the B part says, discuss whether solving the problem of unemployment should be the main policy objective for the government in developing countries. So talk about uh, the other goals. So this is where, talk about macro economic goals, which is unemployment, inflation, economic growth, and balanced payment, but also for the developing countries, income distribution, distribution becomes a goal to look at. Now, when you are solving the problem of unemployment, there's always what we can talk about how there's a trade-off in the short run, but not in the long run. So you talk about that, but then also talk about when you're looking at solving unemployment, you may run into issues of, you may run into, into issues of, uh, you know, like challenges, like for example, you know, uh, economic growth and balance of payment as well. So talk about the trade-offs that happen. So first talk about what are these various goals, what are the various trade-offs that happen? And then talk about in the developing countries, other goals are important because in the developing countries, a country, um, you may not only solve the problem of unemployment, uh, you may need to look at other concern, concerns as well. Now, had it been this um, 20, 20 mark question, uh, we would have talked about the features of the developing countries and we would talk about then the alternative aims um, uh, or uh, all the macroeconomic aims and their trade offs. Okay. Any questions, guys? Guys, any question before we move on? So quickly, what are the macroeconomic? So just a quick summary, what are the macroeconomic goals, right? They talk about unemployment. By the way, they think whether solving the problem of unemployment should be the main policy, because talk about the why unemployment goals are important, because when you solve unemployment, you're also making the GDP of the economy to go up, right? So automatically unemployment and economic growth are interlinked. However, Inflation is a possibility and balance of payment is another possibility where there's a, you know, trade-off. Developing countries, uh, guys, uh, you can also talk about uh, developing countries have issues of, um, you know, inflation and balance of payment. And so all of these goals may be important to consider 
before we uh, decide. Could we talk about the clashes of economic goals in this? So there is, there has to be macroeconomic goals and it's uh, uh, um, what do you call um, uh, conflicts is something which you have to talk about. Because when you go for, for example, solving, solving unemployment and uh, uh, therefore you get economic growth and you get actual growth, you may suffer from uh, inflation in the short run. Also, balance of payment can also worsen because of that goal. And economic growth happens, distribution of income can go unfair. So you've got to have that um, uh, answer. Somebody's saying, is it important to go through course book or notes are just enough? Course book, too late, my friend. Uh, notes are just good enough. Um, I don't know what notes are you studying from. Uh, if you're studying from my notes, I would say they are like a course book. So yeah, that's good enough. Yeah, that's good enough. You don't have time for books now, guys. Okay, let's look at this one. Explain what is meant by quantitative easing and consider whether it uh, is an effective policy to be used in a recession. So quantitative easing, we've talked about this in multiple questions. So quantitative easing, quantitative easing is basically the government is sort of buying or purchasing uh, what we call purchasing government securities or bonds. And as a result of that, the government is buying bonds. What happens is that government buys the bonds and give money to people. So money supply goes up. Um, and by the way, when your government is buying securities, it's kind of like increasing the price of these bonds. So price of bonds uh, basically uh, goes up. And when the price of bonds go up, there is an inverse relationship between price of bonds and interest rates, okay? Because when the interest rates are really low, people don't uh, sort of um, care about sort of, uh, you know, liquidity because interest rate low means liquidity is high. So the idea is when you government is buying, purchasing government security, money supply will go up and that in turn will make the AD curve shift up because what you're trying to do is that you're increasing the demand for bonds and then automatically uh, a lot of people will get more money in the economy, more liquidity, and that in turn will make the GDP to go up via the multiplier. So the idea is, is that uh, the increase um, in sort of spending that happens will make the AD curve shift to the right um, and that Basically, AD curve shifting to the right means GDP will go up via the uh, multiplier. However, this kind of policy uh, um, has a, a kind of uh, a limitation, which is something called liquidity trap. When we draw our, you know, your liquidity preference curve, if I increase money supply, if I keep on increasing money supply, there will come a point where interest rate will stop falling if you keep on buying what because why because it comes a point where people the, the interest rates are so low and the price of bonds is so high that people do not buy bonds any further because they like uh, or people don't trade in bonds any further because they, there is excess liquidity out there so they're saying explain what is meant by quantities and consider whether it's an effective policy to be used in a recession in a recession guys when your economy Sort of is lowering interest rates, right? You can keep on doing that. You can keep on increasing money supply from MS, let's say, not to MS1 to MS2. Initially, you will keep on seeing when the interest rate goes down, you will see that your uh, monetary policy will be affected. But, but if there is a liquidity trap, this is where you will see that the policy will stop working. So, because they're saying, consider, this is an evaluation discussion. Consider whether it's an effective policy to be used in a session. The answer is, it depends uh, on whether the money supply is so high that it is resulting in liquidity trap or not. Uh, what is liquidity trap in the diagram? Liquidity trap is basically here. If the money supply keeps on increasing, they come to the point the interest rates are completely flat. They stop changing. Why? Because 
there's so much liquidity in the market people are not basically buying government other government securities and so on because they know the price of these interest interest is so low and the price of securities is so high that if you buy these securities they will only fall in price so if that happens then the government monetary policy will become ineffective got it does that make sense Okay, B part says policies to achieve economic growth will inevitably cause a government budget deficit. How far do you agree with this statement? So, guys, policies to achieve economic growth. So, we're talking about economic growth. Uh, economic growth could be um, actual and uh, potential. So, talk about what is economic growth and what are the various types of economic growth. Then you talk about economic growth can be achieved through if there's actual economic growth. We're looking at AD to go up through you know like your fiscal policy or your monetary policy if you're looking at fiscal policy you're looking at g to go up or t to go down and that can result in by the deficit okay which is where you can see t minus g to be less than zero if you're looking at monetary policy you then are uh, lowering your interest rates and that will cause the ad to go up which will not lead to a budget deficit so only if you're looking at within actual, if you're looking at fiscal policy, there is a budget deficit possibility. Okay. Then we talk about um, when you look at potential, you are looking at LRAS, which you found, which means you're looking at a possibility of aggregate LRAS to shift out. And that basically can only happen, which is through uh, what we call supply side policy. We talk about supply side policies, which by the way, can lead to government spending to go up and can lead to budget deficit. Okay, why? Because when the government spending is going up because you are undertaking, for example, you are undertaking uh, education, infrastructure, so on, there will be a possibility of a government deficit to increase. Okay, so you can talk about here, that short run and long run effect as well. You can talk about how in the short run, if you are going to solve the problem of uh, economic growth, then there will be a possibility of more taxes or tax revenue to happen in the long run. And therefore, there could be a short run effect of a deficit which may not be happening in the long run. Okay, so talk about the possibility that the long run may not happen. Uh, because the economy may achieve economic growth. Okay, but short run can have, can, can be a possibility. If you're doing A, uh, if you're doing A, like uh, your uh, fiscal policy, or if you're looking at potential, you're spending more to do this. Okay, are we good? A good question, guys, because you were talking about economic growth and you're talking about budget deficit, talk about uh, fiscal monetary and supply side policies here, and how possibility of potential economic growth happens through supply side, which requires um, government to run into budget deficit, uh, probably in the short run, but in the long run, when the incomes go up and the policies become effective, you may not be able to see the deficit to last. Okay, guys, does that make sense? Any questions? So that's it for today. Uh, I'll see you guys on the third now. Uh, and you have more exams coming. So good luck with that. Okay. See you guys soon. Um, I'm really worried about P4 for econ. What tip would you recommend and how do we probably structure 20? So I'm going to send some videos. Uh, I've shared some on Coley uh, and uh, on the all platform. I'm going to sort of make some about the 20 mark question, uh, specifically some strategies. Okay, Anwar, does that make sense? Um, don't worry about it. Worrying is not going to help us. We need to do is um, basically prepare the key topics and hopefully things will be sorted. Last few days, uh, if, if, if your content is not, still not very good, please do in different scope and utility theory. Please do, uh, for example, <clears throat> the, the topic that we talked about, the efficiency one completely. 
and market failure completely, then um, if I would like you guys to focus on uh, is, uh, is, is going to the macro part, you are going to be better off looking at all the fiscal monetary supply sub policies, at least get that sort, sorted. Um, and also in A levels, the challenge now will be that the topics will be varied. So don't leave any topic, have a working knowledge of all the topics. Like you previously, we used to have like some topics we would do really well, but now we can't go on with that strategy. Okay. Are we good? Thank you very much. Good luck, guys. See you soon. Bye bye.